We ought to be able to do that. And, and as slow, Republicans how would you slow do. it? Well, I, I would slow it uh, by adding some competition in, into the health care business. Back to the free market. Yeah. But um, it's, it's hard to do. If it were easy, we would have done a long time ago. But basically, the last time we addressed the national debt, we appointed a super committee to make tough decisions on on things that that are really easy to demagogue. You know, it, uh, Social Security now, you have to be 66 and a half mm -hmm. to retire at full Social Security. We may need to have a conversation about raising the Medicare eligible age up to match Social Security. What is now, it now? I'm curious. What is 65? 65. It's been, it's been 65 okay. since it was uh, implemented in, in, uh, in the Johnson administration. Well, uh, the, um, the average life expectancy uh, back then in the Johnson administration was under 70. Now, you know, it's up around 80. So people are living longer and they're on Medicare longer. Um, we need to look at that. But we're going to have to do it. Something like that has and, and to be done on this, a bipartisan basis. Regardless of the solution, somebody is not going to be happy with it. Well, you, you would rather have the super deluxe Cadillac program every time. Yeah. But as a family, your family and my family, sometimes you have to sit around the kitchen table and say, we just can't afford that anymore. We sure would like to keep going like we have been, but we just can't do it. And, uh, and our budget can't sustain it as families. And this is what we need to do as part of the American family. We need to get together and say we can protect Medicare long term. And I want to protect Medicare long term, like Reagan and O'Neill did to Social Security. But we're going to have to do it as, uh, as Americans and not on a bipartisan basis. Anything of importance. Um, of real long-term significance has always that's worked has always been done on a bipartisan basis the Civil Rights Act um, in in the mid 60s 1964 Civil Rights Act uh, couldn't have been passed without the support of President Johnson a Democrat and Republicans like Everett Dirksen in the United States Senate the Republican leader it worked because it was bipartisan and uh, we're going to have to grow up in uh, in the Senate and in the House and start looking toward the next generation instead of the next election. Now you've been involved in some uh, bipartisan efforts in the Senate recently. Right. Uh, if you would share that uh, with us and I may have a follow-up or two. Well, and, and I've gotten some credit for that, but also I've been criticized by some of the partisans for that. Basically, um, we try to work in the Senate, uh, not necessarily on a one-vote majority rule. In the House of Representatives, you get up a majority of 218 to 217, you can pass any bill you want to in the House of Representatives. Uh, we have debate rules and consensus rules. Somebody call, some people call it the filibuster. But, but they're designed for one House of the Congress to have more debate more consideration, more conciliation, and more consensus. And that's the Senate. And we were about to lose that basically um, by the majority changing the rules, by breaking the rules in the middle of the session. And I thought, and I think a majority of, of members thought, um, including some very principled Democrats, that that would destroy the Senate as an institution that we've known for the last uh, 200 years or more. And so I, I, I stood up on the floor of the Senate and asked the majority leader if he would convene a meeting of all senators in the old Senate chamber so we could sort of look at this issue with a historic perspective. This is the chamber where Daniel Webster had some of the great debates. Henry Clay, the great compromiser, uh, was a senator in the old chamber. And from time to time, since it was re, um, uh, remodeled and, and refurbished in, in uh, 1976 for the bicentennial, the Senate has gone in there at moments of crisis. And we were at a moment of crisis. And we stayed in there some three hours. 
everybody that wanted to got a chance to talk. And at the end of the day, we're able to avert this crisis and and not see a meltdown in, in the U.S. Senate. I was very pleased that we did that. Uh, could that be the springboard to more consensus, or do you think well, that was just a one one and done well, deal? Well, it should be. You know, this this fall is a good opportunity for us. Um, every two years, every even numbered years, is an election year. So if we don't if we're not able to do something to rein in long term spending this fall, then guess what? January is going to come around. It's 2014. All of the House is up for re-election. One third of the Senate is up for re-election, and and we kind of lose that that chance. Um, shouldn't be that way. We ought to always look toward the next generation. But but we've had um, we've had trouble reaching consensus. But I, I say this: we can slow the growth rate of these really important programs like Social Security and Medicare. Uh, without hurting people, I, I just think we—I think we can cover the needed uh, benefits that people have, uh, have a right to expect under these programs. After all, they've, they've paid the premiums in over time. They've—they've they've spent a whole lifetime planning for retirement under these rules. I think we can adjust the rules uh, in a way that is not going to deprive anybody of health care or uh, of, uh, of a benefit that they've earned. What we need to say is, while we're doing that, we've got to think of the long term. We've got to think about my 20-month-old uh, grandson, Henry, who someday, uh, he and his generation will be running the country and, and we'll be dead and gone. What, what sort of, a, of um, a financial situation are we going to leave for them? Are we going to leave them a situation like Greece has? Where, where people are in the streets, they uh, they don't they don't believe that anything the government is doing is uh, is uh, going to work, but they're opposing any sort of financial discipline. We don't want to leave a situation where the United States becomes Greece or Spain or France. Uh, we we want to leave them uh, uh, a legacy that's worthy of Americans. We've always been the leaders and things like this. And so um, we, we have a very, very serious situation facing us. And I would hope that uh, some of the negotiations that are going on can get us where we need to, to be um, before the, probably not before the end of the fiscal year, which happens October the 1st, but before the end of uh, Year. We've just got a couple of minutes left okay. in our broadcast. Quickly, if you would, uh, share with us uh, what's going on as far as protecting military installations in Mississippi. Well, we're worried about two things. Uh, we're worried ab about an authorized BRAC base closing round like we had uh, three times before, where there's a process to close bases. I don't think we will authorize that. I'm on the Armed Services Committee. Our chairman has said we won't do that. But then there's also the sort of the shadow BRAC, where the military moves planes away or takes missions away from one base and gives them to the other as a way to get to consolidation. We need to worry about that also. All right. Senator Roger Wicker has been with us for the half hour, and we want to thank you again.